Alright, so let's get into this video. As I said, these are cases about people who went mysteriously missing around Christmas time. They have never ever been found, and there were barely any clues leading to where they may have been or are now. They simply just vanished without a trace, and sometimes I feel like that's even worse, because no one ever knows what happened, and it's just so hard to have closure from that. It's a lot easier to just have answers that you want. If you guys are longtime subscribers, you know know that I had a best friend in high school who went missing. She literally just disappeared one day. I literally saw her one day and then she was gone the next. I remember the very last day that I saw her, we were hanging out and just before she went home, she gave me this extra long hug and said goodbye with tears in her eyes. It was just very strange to me, but at the time, I didn't really think anything was that wrong. It didn't hit me how strange it was until the next day when she was gone. And if I put all the clues together, it sounds like she might have been put into a witness protection program. This video topic today just reminded me of that and I have like probably eight videos just on that whole story on my channel if you guys are interested. But anyways though, let's talk about the unexplained disappearances around Christmas time. This first case is from December 23rd of 1974. This happened in Texas. A girl named Rachel took her friends Renee and Julie on a shopping trip to Fort Worth Seminary South Shopping Center to do their Christmas shopping. It was just meant to be a fun day, the three of them spending time together and shopping, but the thing is, they never came home. Several witnesses had reported definitely seeing the girls in the mall that day, so we do know that they had gotten inside safely. We do know that they were actively shopping at one point, but the girls' abandoned car was discovered in the Sears parking lot, but the three girls' whereabouts are still unknown. And like I said, this happened all the way back in the 70s, and and the really strange thing about this case is that it appears the girls did make it back to their car after they went shopping because the gifts they had purchased were found in the car. It's just that they weren't with them. Now the girls were presumed to be runaways by the police, but what's eerie is that the day after they went missing, Rachel's husband received a letter in the mailbox at their home. And this letter appeared to be written by Rachel herself. And this is what the letter said. I know I'm going to catch it, but we had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears upper lot. Love, Rachel. The thing that was strange was the letter was very out of character for Rachel. Her family didn't think that she would just leave at of nowhere with two kids and literally not tell anybody. And she addressed the letter to Thomas and she only ever called her husband Tommy. And to make matters even creepier, she misspelled her own name. What? I don't know about you guys, but to me, that is so suspicious. Now, Rachel at the time was 17 and her two friends were 14 and nine. And it's just so heartbreaking to read stories like this, especially with no outcome at all. And they've actually been named the Fort Worth Missing Trio. Okay guys, so let's move on to the next case. This one was from December 5th, 1998. An eight-year-old boy named Derek disappeared while searching for a Christmas tree with his father and grandfather in Winema National Forest. They had noticed that he suddenly went missing and they were able to follow a circular path of footprints in the snow that led to a road. Now the area where the footprints ended, there was a snow angel in the snow and there was also bits of chopped wood everywhere, which was strange. The thing is, by the time law enforcement arrived to conduct a search, there was a terrible blizzard and no one was able to see anything. So they basically had to wait out the storm and couldn't go out and actively search for him right away. And those first few hours are like key to finding somebody. In the end, there were no leads to where this boy was, but there were many reports from people saying there was a mysterious vehicle in the area the day he went missing. And actually more than 10,000 hours of search time was spent on this case. And like I said, still to this day, the boy has not been found. So that is super heartbreaking as well. I mean, the boy was only eight years old. And lastly, we have a case that happened on December 8th of 2000. Trevor Daly was returning home from his work's Christmas Christmas party in Dublin. Now, he was last seen talking to an unknown man outside of his office building, and the police know this because they were able to look at the building's security footage, so he was talking to this mysterious man at 4.14 a.m. And after talking to this mysterious person, he is then seen walking past a bank in the direction of his apartment. And these are actual photos from security cams on the street. This is him walking home past the bank. But about 30 seconds 
seconds later, the security footage shows another figure walking behind him. This figure is all dressed in black, you can't even see who it is. But police think it was the same man that he had been talking to outside of his office building. So he was clearly being stalked in this footage. What's creepy is that the security footage showed that mysterious man waiting an hour outside of Trevor's office building before Trevor even spoke to him. So it was almost like he knew who Trevor was and he was purposely waiting for him there. Now, Trevor never made it back to his apartment. And to this day, the mysterious man in this footage has never come forward. They've never figured out who it is. And what's so sad is that while he was walking home from work, he actually called his friend and left a voicemail. And the voicemail just said, hi, Glenn, I've missed you there. Just on my way home, all going good. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And that's the last thing his friend ever heard. I mean, there are different theories about what could have happened for all three of these cases, but I don't really love talking about theories that people have because not all of them are accurate or true. I don't know guys, it's just so, so sad. And this particular one we're gonna be discussing today is a very tragic case from 1945 and it actually happened on Christmas Eve. And this case is actually said to be one of America's greatest unsolved mysteries. So yeah, the story I'm about to tell you is both heartbreaking and eerie at the same time. All right guys, so let's jump right into this case because it is a pretty long one to cover. There's a lot of details. And of course, if I miss any really important information and you know about this case, please comment it down below. So back in 1945, there was this mother and father named George and Jenny Sauter. And the both of them had 10 children, which is insane. They had this very large family and on one particular Christmas Eve, all of them were together except for the eldest sibling. He was away in the army. So the nine children were together with their parents celebrating Christmas Eve. And when it was finally time to go to bed, five of the children asked for for special permission to stay up later. I'm sure you guys know what it's like being excited on Christmas Eve. I've always found it very, very hard to go to sleep because you're so excited for Christmas the next day. So their mother told them they could stay up for a little while longer, as long as they promised to take care of the farm animals, to turn off all the lights, to close all the curtains, and to lock all of the doors. So the children promised their mother that they would definitely do that before they went to bed. So then the mother and father and their four other their children went to bed. So like I said, five of the children stayed up longer. And because it is very important, here are the names of the five children who stayed up. We have, we have Maurice, who was 14. We have Martha, who was 12. Louis, who was 10. Jenny, who was eight. And Betty, who was six. Now at 12.30 a.m., the phone rang, which was extremely bizarre. I mean, who would be calling that late at night before the sun had even come up? So Jenny, who was the mother, got out of bed and went into the hallway to answer the phone. Now she picked up and there was this woman on the other end of the phone who was talking very strangely. And it sounded like there were several other people talking in the background. It was almost like she was at a very loud party or something. Now the woman asked Jenny for someone that Jenny did not know. So obviously Jenny told this woman that she must have had the wrong number and that the person she was asking for did not live in this house. Now the creepiest part of this whole exchange is that the woman woman on the other end began laughing very creepily and strangely, and then she quickly hung up the phone. So obviously Jenny was extremely confused as to what that was all about and why the woman found their conversation to be so humorous. Suddenly she realized that her house was very, very quiet. All of the lights were still on. All of the curtains were still open. The front door was unlocked. So she just thought that maybe the five children who had stayed up forgot to close everything and turn everything off before they went to bed. She thought it must have just been an honest mistake. So she closed up the house and returned to her bedroom, assuming that the children had gone to bed. She went back to sleep and around 1 a.m. she woke up because she heard what she described as a heavy object hitting the roof and rolling off of it. Now, obviously she found this to be extremely strange, but she kind of just shrugged it off and went back to sleep. Then around 2 a.m. she woke up to the smell of smoke. So she was terrified. She woke up her husband and ran out of the door of her bedroom. The 
hallway was filled with smoke and flames were covering the stairways leading up to the children's bedroom. So George and Jenny started shouting up the stairs telling everyone to get out of the house as quickly as possible. And once they were outside, they started to count all the children to make sure they had everybody. And it showed that the five children who had stayed up later were not outside with them. The flames grew quickly and blocked George from going back into the house. So he came up with this plan to climb a ladder to get to the upstairs window. He figured he'd be able to like help out his children through there. So he raced to the side of the house where the ladder always stood, but the ladder was gone. Panicking, George then thought that maybe he could move one of his trucks up to the house, climb on top of the roof, and then help his children down that way. So he ran to the first truck and it wouldn't start. And then he ran to the second truck and it too wouldn't start. Which was also extremely strange because the day before his trucks had been working perfectly. They were full of gas, everything was fine. So why now? All George and Jenny and the four children who had managed to flee the house could do was to watch the fire burn down their house. Now this fire was brutal and reduced the house to only ashes in only an hour. And it wasn't until hours later that the police and firemen arrived to investigate the scene. Apparently they couldn't get there quicker because it was very early on Christmas morning. And I guess back then they didn't have like the amount of resources that we do in these times. The coroner was consulted and it was determined that the five children had undoubtedly perished in the fire. And they said that the fire was caused by faulty wiring. But George and Jenny were not satisfied with this explanation. They did not think that this was just an accident. And they suspected that there was something more to find out. They demanded answers. So here are some of the reasons why they did not think that their children died in the fire that day. Number one, there were no human remains found anywhere in the rubble. The police and firemen had looked through all of the ashes and they produced no skeletons. And it's well known that skeletons don't usually disintegrate in a house fire. Like the house would have to be burning for an entire day for skeletons to no longer be there, but it only burned for an hour. And George had heard of another house that had been on the news weeks prior that had burned for hours and hours and hours and they even had skeletons still there. Number two, there was this very strange piece of evidence. The police had come across a bus driver who stated that he had seen what he described as fireballs being thrown onto the roof of the house. So could this have been the noise that Jenny had heard that woke her out of her sleep? And if fireballs were being thrown at their house, obviously that was someone purposely trying to set their house on fire. Then there was this creepy third piece of evidence from this woman who was very familiar with the Sauter family and she said she had definitely seen the five children jumping into this stranger's car while the fire was starting. And then there was a fourth piece of evidence saying that at a diner 50 miles west of where they lived, a waitress said she had served breakfast to five children who had no parents with them. And she said it kind of looked like the kids in the posters, but she wasn't sure. As word spread and photographs of the children were shown in the vicinity, a woman said that she saw the children in the company of four adults at a hotel in South Carolina. So, so many people were coming forward saying they had seen these children, but there was just not enough evidence that these stories were true. And even with all this potential evidence, the police refused to help these parents any further. The police fully believed these children had died in the fire. So the parents had to take things into their own hands and investigate on their own. They erected a billboard near the site of their former home, which featured photos of the five children and they announced they would be giving $10,000 to someone who brought them back unharmed. They think that whoever set this fire was trying to cover the tracks of some sort of abduction. Now years and years went by with no clues, no progression in the case, and then in 1968 something really creepy arrived at the parents house. 23 years after the fire, Jenny got a letter in the mail. It had been mailed from a city in Kentucky and inside there was a photograph of this young man. And on the back, there was a little letter that said, Louis Sauter, I love brother Frankie, LLIL -L boys, A90132. It was extremely random, but it was sort of insinuating that this was from one of their sons that had disappeared. Now the police thought it was just some sort of cruel hoax, but George and Jenny really thought this photograph looked exactly like how Louis would have looked like as an adult. They really believed it to be him. There was just a lot of similarities, but no one was able to find this person in the photograph. Now, George Sauter passed away only a year after they received this letter. And then 20 years after that, Jenny passed away in 1989. The billboard came down after Jenny's death and 
a new house now stands on the site of the former Sauter house. But there are so many questions that people still have about this case. Like who was the woman on the phone that happened right before the fire? Was she in some way connected? Who moved the ladder that was on their house? Who stopped their cars from working? Who threw the fireballs on their house that night? Who sent the photo in 1968? Who was the man in the photo? I mean, there are so many questions about this case. It is a huge mystery to this day. And there definitely are a lot more details that I would not be able to cover today or this video would be like an hour long. So if you want to do your own research and look into this, definitely do so. But if I missed any like critical information, please comment it down below. Okay, so without further ado, let's get right into today's video about the footprint mystery of 1855. There was an extraordinary trail of imprints in the snow in southwest England that materialized over the course of the night of the 9th of February, 1855. There had been a very heavy snowfall that night, and when people woke up in the morning, they saw that the prints looked as though they had been created by cloven hooves. And at first you might think, okay, Jess, these were probably created created by animals, elks, deers. There are a lot of animals that roam through the snow at night and I get that. But here is what is so strange about this discovery. The trail of hooves could be seen for a hundred miles. They were found in fields and lanes and they scaled rooftops and jumped up drain pipes and they were undeterred by solid objects like haystacks or walls. They could even suddenly jump across an icy river. Now animals obviously can't climb walls. They are not Spider-Man. Like like people would literally be following a trail of these strange hooves and suddenly they would go up the side of the house at a 90 degree angle. It was the most bizarre thing that anyone had ever seen. One farmer recounted these footprints stopping on one side of a haystack only to restart on the other with the stack untouched. They would suddenly go through gardens with high fences. People had backyard with giant fences and they'd see the footprints start and then suddenly they were on the other side of the fence. These footprint trails were everywhere in places that it would literally be impossible. Imagine waking up in the morning and seeing these strange footprints all on your front lawn and you're following it, following it, and suddenly they go straight up, up the side of your house, onto your roof, down the other side, maybe over your car, maybe up a tree. I mean, it was just crazy. And because it was so utterly unexplainable, people named this phenomenon the devil's footprints because they deemed it must have been done by something not of this earth. The cloven hoof shape of the devil's footprints were said to resemble those of a donkey, but the gait was not that of a four-legged animal. People believe that these belong to a two-legged creature. So something that would literally walk around like a human. Right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Each of the devil's hoof prints measured about three inches wide and four inches long, which is not dissimilar to that of a donkey's, but the steps were extremely small. When donkeys walk, there's like a huge gap in between each one. But it says the steps, however, were extremely small, spaced between eight and 16 inches apart, and they were in single file, which is so weird. So let's talk about the theories that people have come up with. The first theory is that it was all a hoax. While everyone was sleeping, a bunch of people went out there and just like made these hoof prints all over the place, made them go up walls, made them go in weird places. But the only issue with that idea is that how could someone do that and go a hundred miles in a span of one night? And how were they able to go up the side of very large houses over fences? It would take like weeks to pull that off properly. Another theory is that it really was just animals and several types of animals have been thought to have created these footprints. We have cats, hares, mice, and badgers because smaller animals can scale walls sometimes or areas that are harder for large larger animals to reach. Some even say that it was a kangaroo that had escaped from a private zoo in Exmouth, England. Birds have often been suggested too, especially as flight would account for the gaps in prints. But the thing is, all of these animals I just mentioned don't have hoof prints. You know what I mean? So I feel like people are forgetting about that part of it. There have been those who have attributed the marks to UFOs and sea monsters, although without much traction. And there's just not enough evidence to figure out what happened 
happened, especially back in 1855. They didn't have like proper investigations to do. They didn't have enough sources to really figure out who did this or what did this. So to this day, it is deemed unsolved because they really have no idea what happened. And when people think back on this event, they really do attribute it to the supernatural. Something more sinister walked around in the middle of the night and freaked people out in the morning. When I heard about this, I was just flabbergasted as to how this could have happened. So I had to come on here and tell you guys, it's not the longest story in the world, but it's still a very mysterious one. Okay guys, so let's talk about the curious case of the frozen girl. Jean Hilliard was a 19 year old girl that was living in the small town of Langby, Minnesota in December of 1980. And at the time, this town had a very, very small population of only 87 people. And all surrounding this small town were forests, lakes, farmland. It kind of felt like the town was in the middle of nowhere. Well, on the night of December 20th of 1980, Jean was making her way home from a night out with friends. She was coming home at midnight and it was minus 22 degrees outside. That is freezing. Her and her friends had been at the Faustin American Legion, where young adults in the town typically spent the evening as it was the coolest hangout spot. And her dad's Ford LTD that she was driving home had rear wheel drive and no anti-lock brakes, which made for a dangerous vehicle to have while driving on a dark, frozen, icy road. So the car unfortunately slid into a ditch. She got out of it and decided to try and walk home herself. She also knew that her friend Wally lived about two miles down the road, but as she walked home for some time, she realized his home seemed further and further than she thought. And when she finally saw the lights of Wally's home, everything went black. So here's where things are firstly very sad, but also very, very strange. At dawn around 7 a.m., Wally woke up and walked out of his house to see this human-sized lump out in the snow about 15 feet from his door. And when he got a little bit closer, he saw that it was Jean wearing a coat and mittens. He knew Jean well because she was dating his best friend at the time, but there she was on the ground in front of his house, frozen solid. She was lying there with her eyes wide open with frost covering them. And it's just so sad because she had collapsed mere seconds before arriving at his house where she could have warmed up. So he picked her up, placed her on his porch, and he thought for sure that she was dead until he looked closer and saw that there were these bubbles coming out of her nose. So he rushed her to the hospital, which was about 10 minutes away. And her frozen body was so stiff that he actually struggled getting her into his car. So let's talk about this whole medical mystery. When she arrived at the hospital, the attending staff had very little hope for her case. Her skin was so frozen that they couldn't even poke it with hypodermic needles. Like they'd place the needles on her skin and they would break on contact. Her body temperature was so low that it wouldn't even register on a thermometer. Her skin and face were gray. Her eyes weren't responding to light. A quote from the doctor was, the body was cold, completely solid, just like a piece of meat out of the deep freeze. And even though they figured she was dead at this point, medical staff decided to gradually warm her up with heating pads. And eventually they got a faint pulse of 12 beats per minute. And at this point they thought that that maybe she was still alive. And about three hours after they started to thaw her out, they heard her give this faint whimper. And by midday, she had woken up with full body spasms. And then only a couple hours later, she was fully talking coherently as if nothing happened. In fact, she was saying that she was more worried about wrecking her father's car. She felt totally normal, but to everyone else, she was definitely a miracle. And there are a couple explanations to tell us why this might might have happened to her, medical science determined that as a person's body cools, blood flow slows down to a crawl, just as it would for a bear in hibernation. And at this point, the body requires less oxygen. And when a person's blood flow increases at the same rate as their body temperature, they often recover. And that's what may have happened with the heating pads they used on Jean, which was basically nothing short of a miracle. If they hadn't thought about doing that, she definitely would not have survived. And Jean now leads a pedestrian in life, she suffered no ill effects from her ordeal, and she has since married, had kids, and divorced. The only thing that she changed about her life is that she never drives on icy roads at midnight, which I definitely would not blame her for. 
first historical ghost is called the Mistletoe Bride. Now, the legend of the Mistletoe Bride has been retold for centuries, and it has also taken many different forms. And while the story's true origin is difficult to determine, many have come to believe its roots are in the disappearance of Lord Lovell's bride at the Bramshill House in Hampshire, England. Allegedly, Lord Lovell was preparing to wed a young woman who was the daughter of the owner of Bramshill House. This was around Christmas time, so mistletoe hung throughout the mansion, inspiring the wedding party to play a game. The rules were that this young bride-to-be had to go and hide somewhere in the mansion, and the groomsmen would have to go and seek her out. And the prize was that whoever found her first got to kiss her. Which I find weird if it's not her husband-to-be, but okay. So, the bride went to hide, and the wedding party went to seek her out. However, the minutes turned to hours, and they still could not find her. And eventually, the game turned terribly serious, because no matter where they looked, she remained missing. Missing. She was gone for 50 years. They were never able to find out where she was hiding. Some thought that maybe she ran away because she didn't want to get married. But 50 years later, Lord Lovell found out where she had been the entire time. He happened upon a secret closet in an upstairs room of the Bramshill house, and inside he found a wooden chest sealed shut with a lock. And upon opening the chest, he found the nearly unrecognizable remains of his bride, so clearly she had climbed into this chest while she was hiding, thinking it would be a good place, and she didn't realize that it would lock behind her, and that's where she stayed for 50 years, which is awful. And so many people say that around Christmas time, her ghost can be seen around the house, because that is when this game took place. The next Christmas ghost we have is the Brown Lady of Rainham Hall. The reason she's called the Brown Lady is not probably what you think, it's because she was wearing a brown dress. The Lady of Rainham Hall has purple perplexed visitors and paranormal investigators for hundreds of years. Back in the 1700s, the owner Charles Townshend married a young woman named Dorothy Wellpole. And while they lived pretty happily together for some time in Rainham Hall, Charles soon became paranoid that his new wife was being unfaithful to him. So eventually he went mad with jealousy. So he decided to hide Dorothy away in the hall, telling all of their friends and family that she had tragically passed away. So Dorothy was forced to stay inside this mansion, allowed to only wander through its halls, and not long after this, she tragically perished, never having been able to leave this mansion where her husband kept her. And ever since her passing, people have witnessed the image of a woman in a tattered brown dress wandering through the halls, and some of these reported encounters are really terrifying. One visitor who was unaware of this woman's legend said that this woman approached him in the hall, and she had this glowing face, but where her eyes should have been, there were just these dark, empty eye sockets, which would be terrifying to see. And years later, after numerous other reported sightings, a photographer from Country Life magazine visited Rainham Hall to document it for an article, and he snapped this photograph on the stairwell, which has become famous. He saw this hazy silhouette coming down the stairs, which is obviously thought to be Dorothy, and it's one of the creepiest historical ghost photos like ever. And then lastly, we have the legend of the Christmas Phantoms. This happened a few weeks before Christmas in 1878. A man named Edward F. Smith was at his home in Brooklyn, New York when the doorbell rang. He answered the door, but there was no one there. And this soon became a nightly occurrence. The doorbell would ring, he would answer it, and no one would be standing there on his porch. And there were no signs that anyone had been there at all, even if the snow was was covering his steps, there was no footprints. No matter where he and his family stood around the house, the noises remained unidentifiable. Smith and his family were obviously growing more and more concerned. The doorbell started ringing more aggressively, and banging started to be heard from the doors. It was like someone really, really wanted to get inside their house. They were desperate. So eventually they contacted the police because they wanted to figure out who was doing this to them. But the ringing and banging continued, the police couldn't find out what was happening, and one night a brick suddenly flew through the window from the outside, even though police officers were standing all outside their house and they saw no one do it. Although they investigated this home for some time, weeks and weeks on end, this case was unsolved because they had no idea who was terrorizing this family. Smith 
and those who witnessed the strange occurrences ultimately concluded they must be paranormal in nature. I'm always so unsettled when things are unsolved, but it does fascinate me as well. But to me, this seems very paranormal. This story is called The Horrific Tale of Anora Petrova. This tale has been going around the internet for years now, and for years it's really been freaking people out. Before we start, comment down below if you've ever been a figure skater, if you're a skater, or maybe you play hockey or something, comment down below, because this might freak you out the most. An accomplished figure skater from Portland, Oregon named Anora Petrova was practically born to skate. Training from the age of 10 and winning her first championship at the young age of 13. Now everyone in her life called her Annie, like her friends and family, so we're gonna call her Annie in this video. Now Annie's talent was soon recognized by this very famous figure skater trainer. His name was Sergi Palukiv. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing everybody's names wrong. But he actually began coaching her in hopes that one day she would actually be able to go to the Olympics. But this is the part in the story where Annie's fate takes a very bizarre and disturbing turn. Apparently on the night before she was going to compete in Portland's Ice Crystal Classic skating competition, she decided to input her name into a Google search. And I feel like we've all done this at some point in our lives. We're all just curious people. We want to know what's out there about us. I've done this way too many times and I've stopped because of the things that I found. <laughs> but the search returned a shocking result. She found a Wikipedia page that was dedicated to her life and her career and she had no idea who created it. The strangest part though is that this Wikipedia Wikipedia page said that she would win the competition the next day and this competition hadn't happened yet So it was like predicting her result before it happened which really freaked her out She immediately assumed that maybe her father created this page to sort of give her Encouragement for her upcoming competition, but when she brought it up to him He had no idea what she was talking about more focused on the competition for the moment Annie mostly forgot about the page, but she did win just as it predicted. She couldn't believe it, she was in shock, and when it came time for her next competition, she remembered that Wikipedia page and decided to go on it again to see if it once again predicted her results. And she was right, it had been updated once again, and just like before, it said she would win, and when her competition came around, she did she won again. Bizarrely, it continued to predict her success time and time again, as each win brought her closer and closer to the upcoming sectional championships. She became so confident with this Wikipedia page that one day she decided to try something new. Instead of waiting for the page to update on its own, she thought that she would try to edit the Wikipedia page herself to see if she could make this happen for herself. Because this major competition was only several several months away. So she edited the page to see if she could influence the outcome and this is where her nightmare began. Not only did she become blocked from editing the page, but she found that her entry had been modified again. But this time the entry said something utterly horrible about her. It literally said, Anora Petrova is a selfish little brat who is going to get what she deserves. Shocked at the now menacing text, Annie began to suspect that the page had been tampered with by her friend Bree, who was an exceptional skater who was also in line to compete in the sectionals. So this girl Bree was Annie's closest competition, so she thought that maybe she was tampering with the page and putting all of these really mean things. Annie was really afraid to confront Bree about this accusation, so instead of talking to her face to face, she actually wrote Bree a letter. This letter was never sent, however, and was reportedly found later by police. Police. And uh, we'll get to that in just a second. So this Wikipedia page continued to predict dire events in Annie's life. It included a career-ending scandal in which she was accused of tampering with Bree's skates, which resulted in Bree having a severe injury and wasn't able to go to sectionals, which then caused Annie to be banned by the sectionals. Like this is what the Wikipedia page was predicting and it was really freaking her out because every other time it was right and she did not want this to happen. So it's so crazy because the Wikipedia page first started predicting really positive and happy and great things and now it was the complete opposite. In an attempt to uncover the identity of 
the person editing the ominous page, she contacted Wikipedia administrators to report what she considered harassment. But oddly enough, the admins told her that they had no record of any page like that. They couldn't even find anything in their history that had to do with her or her name. So obviously that freaked her out even more. And when she logged onto that page again, it was still there, so why couldn't they find the page? But it had been updated again, this time to say, and Nora Petrova is a pathetic orphan whose real parents died in a terrible accident. In a panic, she attempted to contact her parents but received no reply. And a few days later, she was notified that her mother and father had died in a horrible accident. After receiving this news, she obviously went into this emotional breakdown and she actually had to spend some time recovering in a Swiss hospital. It would be several years before she attempted to return to her life's pursuit and eventually she began training again, this time for an open position with a European skating troupe. But that's when she made the horrible mistake of checking the page one last time. And this is what the page said. Honora Annie Petrova, born May 5th, 1991, died October 24th, 2010, was an American Junior Regionals figure skating winner who died a friendless orphan because she was a greedy little piggy. Oh my goodness. And uh, this prediction was proven correct when she was found passed away in her apartment. She was reportedly found by police slumped over her computer keyboard with one document still open. It was the letter to her former friend, Bree. And the final paragraph that she wrote said, There's only a few minutes until midnight now. All I can do is refresh the page. I'm exhausted, but I can't stop. I'm afraid to leave the computer until I know what happens next. So yeah, that's how the story ends. It is such a bizarre tale. Obviously, it's some sort of creepypasta. I cannot imagine this being true, but it still freaks me out about Wikipedia. So I may never Google myself again. <laughs> Billy Coleman. He went missing on January 1st in 1940, and he was 14 years old at the time of his disappearance. This occurred in California at Mount Lassen, which is one of the dominating peaks in the area. Lassen is a national park, and the Coleman family had a cabin right at the foot of the mountain. On January 1st, the family invited a bunch of their family members and friends to come and stay with them for the weekend at their cabin. And at approximately 4 p.m., Billy was playing under a tree near the cabin. Now his mother was continuously checking on him to make sure he was okay, but at one point, only five minutes after she had last seen him, she went and checked again and he was gone. She immediately started calling for him, but he never answered and a search was started. Now the first day that everybody was searching, they found something very unusual. Near a small creek, only 250 feet away from the cabin, they found Billy's overalls and other small pieces of his clothing. Why would he have removed all of his warm clothes. They also found tracks in the area of someone who appeared to have roamed aimlessly. Searchers continued to look for Billy all throughout January. There were literally over 500 people walking the area and it was snowing so much and over a foot of snow ended up covering the ground around the cabin. Everyone was saying that if he wasn't wearing clothes, there was a very small chance of him surviving in this winter weather. And the thing is, they never found him and still to this day, it's a a huge mystery. And like I said, the strangest thing that police can't comprehend is why a young boy would voluntarily strip off his clothing immediately after he left the safety of his cabin in the middle of winter. What's eerie is that the same exact thing happened to another boy of the same age who disappeared only five miles away from where Billy disappeared. Same circumstances and that boy was never found either. It's just really bizarre. And lastly, we have the case of Dennis Wersch he went missing on January 25th of 1958, and he was only 12 years old at this time. On this particular morning, Dennis's parents got him ready to go leave for the Mendocino National Forest for a weekend of boy scouting and camping with his troop. So Dennis and 11 other boys headed into this rugged section of the forest and made camp about 4,000 feet near Grindstone Canyon. And these 11 boys did have their troop masters with them, so they did have adults with them. 
with them. After all of them arrived at their campsite, they unpacked everything and they decided to play a game called Capture the Flag. Now, it was very late in the afternoon when one of the boys realized that Dennis wasn't there. So the boys and the adults all scoured the area yelling his name but found and heard nothing. After about an hour of all of them searching the area, they decided to contact law enforcement. But almost immediately after the search began, they started to get horrific weather. Heavy snow and rain was falling that made the search incredibly dangerous. And by the third day that Dennis was missing, there was over three feet of snow on the ground. So obviously it wasn't looking too good for him. Temperatures were below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So in other words, below zero Celsius. And the sheriff said that the only way Dennis would be able to survive this would be if he took shelter in the boulder strewn gorge. On the ninth day of the search, there was this really horrible accident. One of the searchers was the head football coach from Chicago State College, and he dropped dead of a heart attack while looking for Dennis in the forest. It was so sad and just shows you the extremes people are willing to go to find a lost child. Well, on February 2nd, searchers were just two miles from the boy's original campsite when they found Dennis frozen underneath fur trees. He had not made it through this extreme weather. Now, the odd thing about this case is that many children over the years have disappeared while playing a game with other kids. Like children will literally just vanish while playing outdoor games. And people think with this case in particular that it's very unusual for a 12 year old kid to get lost so quickly when all he had to do was yell for assistance and nobody ever heard any calls for help. So yeah, just another very bizarre case. This first case is about Esther Beck and she went missing on February 2nd of 1923. Now she was 27 years old, so obviously she doesn't qualify as a kid, but her case was so interesting that I had to include it in this video. In December of 1922, Esther Beck was a nursing student at Indiana School of Nursing in Bloomington, Indiana. Apparently in 1923, Esther suffered this nervous breakdown while she was at school and she had to go home because of it. And it's actually very unclear as to what happened to her to cause her to have such an emotional reaction. And then on February 1st of 1923, Esther was living with her parents and around 4.30 p.m. she told her father that she wanted to go on a walk. She also told him that she'd be having dinner at her sister's house. And she was last seen walking out of her parents' front door. On February 2nd, she hadn't returned home and her dad thought that she must have spent the night at her sister's house. When he realized she never made it there, he immediately called the police. And the search for her started right away. They even got the whole community involved in this. They walked far into the country, pretty much as far as they thought a woman would be able to travel on foot in the blistering cold weather. And about five days into the search, they found her and it wasn't good. She was about 15 feet from the road and it appeared as though she tried to hop over a fence and had fallen. But what was strange was that one of her shoes was found right beside her and the other shoe was found way off in the distance along with her hat. Her death was definitely very mysterious. The whole community was very confused. Why was she trying to climb a large fence into a farmer's field? Basically in the middle of nowhere. And what's even eerier is that several missing people have been found in that exact spot over the years. Now they found that no foul play was involved. She literally just fell over a fence, was not able to get up and froze in the snow. So why didn't she go to her sister's house? Why was she in the middle of nowhere? The whole thing was just very odd. The next case is for Andrew Sexton. He went missing on February 25th of 2006 and he was 21 years old at the time. Andrew Sexton was from St. Anthony in Newfoundland. He loved the outdoors and he knew the area very, very well. On February 26th, Andrew and his friends got onto their snowmobiles and planned a trip to a cabin in Goose Cove. It was only about a four mile trip and they had done this route so many times before. Like they knew the way perfectly. They left at 10 a.m. that day. They all arrived at the cabin shortly after but didn't stay long because they knew that a snowstorm was coming and they wanted to get home before then. So they all drove back on their separate snowmobiles and when they arrived home they realized that Andrew wasn't with them. So the police were called and that is when the search began. The snowstorm hit the area and it was pretty bad making their search even harder. So they didn't find him on the first day, but on the second day, they actually found just his snowmobile, but he himself wasn't anywhere near it. What's strange is that the snowmobile was pointed in the wrong direction to get home. It still had a full tank
tank of gas. The keys were in the ignition and it was operable. So the question was, where the heck was Andrew? The police eventually got these bloodhounds to look for him, but no clues were ever found. So the sad thing is, Andrew was never actually located even till this day. Some people in the area say he was abducted by aliens, which is obviously a little crazy. And this case was just so strange because Andrew knew Newfoundland like the back of his hand. He knew all of the outdoors. He had been everywhere before. And the snowstorm hadn't really even begun while they were on their way back home. The friends made it back perfectly, but he was not behind them. They even had divers search the frozen waters to see if maybe he had fallen in and there was nothing. People are just so confused as to why he would just leave his snowmobile there. The large vehicle is easy for people to locate. It's super warm and it was still operational. So this case will always be a mystery. And today we're gonna to be talking about the creepiest things that were found frozen in ice. Which sounds super weird, but you guys would be so surprised of what people have found. This world is such a scary, unpredictable place. So get ready because we're gonna jump right into this video. I'm trying to keep this intro short and sweet for you guys. Sometimes I can't, but sometimes I can. not So the first thing that was found frozen in ice was a very deadly virus. For hundreds of years, people have thought that there are terrible things hiding deep underground or frozen in the Arctic, like illnesses that have been eradicated, that somehow find their way back to the surface after being hidden. You guys probably remember from history, the plague was a huge deadly illness that killed a lot of people around the world. And that illness has currently been put to rest, but what if some of those illnesses were kept under the ice and are now melting and being open to the air again? Well, not too long ago, Ago, scientists actually found a virus that was hidden in the ice that is about 30,000 years old. There is no known cure for this virus because it is so old and it has been nicknamed the pathos virus and it is said to be the largest virus on earth. And this discovery has made scientists say that there could be anything hiding in the ice like illnesses. And especially with global warming making everything melt, all of these things could be exposed to us very, very soon. So guys, let's save the planet as much as we can. The next thing people found was a giant frozen disturbing crater. A crater under Siberia that they named the end of the world is one of the world's largest craters. Oil workers who were flying over Siberia were the first ones to notice the giant hole in the ground and immediately reported their findings. Now scientists were unable to pinpoint how deep this crater actually is and nobody really wants to go way down there to find out, but it reaches about 200 feet across. Now, there are different theories as to what caused this massive hole in the ground. Some people think it could have been caused by a giant explosion, and other people think it could have been caused by a giant meteorite. Either way, this giant hole in the earth is definitely disturbing and eerie. The next thing people found is alien markings in the ice. Two friends that were walking along a frozen lake made a strange discovery when they came across this strange formation in the middle of the lake. This strange mass was actually found in Utah and it just looks like these small patterned holes poking through the ice. But it has such a strange formation that people think it just couldn't be natural. People say it was something aliens left when they visited Earth. And other people speculate it to be a landing spot of a UFO. Some people say it's eggs from some sort of other world. Because when you touch this formation, apparently it's slimy and just super weird to touch. They have been doing research on this for so long and they cannot figure out what it is. So this has just remained a mystery and it's creepy. I mean, I do believe in aliens. I believe in other life out there. So who knows, it could be real. The next thing they found frozen in ice was plane crash wreckage. Recently, a wreckage site was discovered in Alaska, and apparently this wreckage was from a plane crash that happened back in the 1950s, so this is super, super old, and only half of the plane was actually found, and the other half apparently was frozen in ice along with some of the bodies that were never found, so they found all of this stuck in a glacier, which is crazy, so it was all the plane 
main wreckage and a few skeletons, which is absolutely heartbreaking and horrible to find. The next thing they found frozen in ice was a bunch of old photographs. They say it's because about a hundred years ago, a ship ended up crashing. And because of the crash, all of these old photographs were just sort of thrown into the water and stuck into ice. These photographs were actually inside a lockbox that was in a block of ice. And when they opened it, they found all of these black and white images from the crew members that were actually on this ship. Now, when they looked through these pictures, it was actually very sad because it showed all of the crew members and you can see their worried faces because they knew they were lost. They knew they probably weren't gonna make it. So it's kind of like these photos showed their very last moments. The boat basically crashed into ice and a lot of the crew members actually had to walk the rest of the way that they were going. Some didn't make it, but some actually did end up surviving. But it must have been super eerie to find those pictures. found was called a frozen volcano. Now there are so many things that cold weather can freeze. You would absolutely be surprised at the things that could freeze. But normally you wouldn't think like, oh, a volcano can freeze because of how hot it actually is. Now technically these aren't active volcanoes that froze, but instead they are frozen formations in the ground. The immense change in temperature when the ground freezes over, then melts, can be enough to form the ground into strange formations. The fairly flat land is into interrupted by the pertubing hills that are produced from these icy conditions. It's one of nature's strangest phenomenons. And you guys know how much I love phenomenons. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating and I think it would be so cool to actually be there to see these in person. And the last thing they found in frozen waters were sea pigs. They sound so cute and they actually look kind of cute. Sea pigs are actually as weird as they sound. They're from the South Pole and they're not actually pigs, although they dwell in the sea and realistically, they don't resemble pigs at all. They likely get their name from their bulbous shape and pink coloring, but they're actually a species of sea cucumber. So basically all they do is they crawl along the ocean floor, but they live in very, very cold conditions and some of them have been found in ice because it does get so cold. They suck up organic nutrients with their tube-like appendages and often stay to themselves, eating things that have fallen from the ocean surface and settled to the bottom. I have never heard or seen these things in until I did research for this video. They are so, so cute. And I feel like it's a good way to end this video because a lot of the stuff we talked about is so dark and creepy. So it's good to just end with sea pigs. <laughs>